Welcome everyone for this week's lecture. I'm very happy that we have right, uh, Alex Craner, who's a, a good friend and analyst. Uh, and the thing I love most about Alex is that unlike a lot of other financial analysts and commentators, he has a solid grasp of history. And I, how do you know you could trust somebody's judgment? Well, to the degree that they've really internalized the lessons of the drama of history, will give the mind an ability to always map out context and then pass judgment according to discoverable principles of what is shaping the wave that brought us into the present. What is it that the financier oligarchy that does exist, that has existed for a very long time, what is it that not only do they want, but what is it that they're afraid of? What are the weak, weak spots? And when Alex uh, had, when I started reading Alex's historical works, um, citing people like Carol Quigley, I realized, okay, this, this guy, this guy's good. He's onto something and he takes Quigley seriously. Um, <clears throat> the importance right now is we are coming into a point of turbulence, the likes of which most people don't get to experience in many generations. I don't think humanity has ever experienced something of this magnitude. And with that comes also a, a lot of potential for good as well. There's a lot of points where people can reevaluate their false assumptions through crisis, which they would not have been able to do if, the, if times were more stable or comfortable. So there's a certain goodness that could arise by self-examination. Um, but at the same measure, there's also a lot of danger. Alex has uh, returned a couple of weeks ago. He was speaking at, the, at a Eurasian integration conference. Um, there's a lot to go through. I mean, Alex's blog is The Naked Hedgy. He is a hedge fund manage, manager. He's written an incredible best-selling book on Bill Browder called uh, The Grand Deception, which uh, we'll make available in the description box. I, I think everyone should read this. Alex, thank you for taking the time. I, I think what we'll do is just have a few opening remarks from you, and then we'll, we'll have a dialogue with the audience. I know we only have about an hour and a bit, so uh, let's make the best of it. Brilliant. Uh, thank you for the very kind introduction, uh, Matthew. Thank you for the invitation and my warm greetings to all the participants and all the viewers. <clears throat> so basically, uh, yes, I would fully agree with you that we have come to a really, really important juncture in the in humanity's evolution and history. Uh, I think we've come to a final clash between two models of governing of, 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 of governing. This is precisely what George Soros has said during his uh, presentation at the last uh, Davos gathering. Basically, he, he pretty much said it that what we're facing is a clash between two models of governance. Of course, he calls one uh, the open societies versus the closed societies, um, pretending that the open societies, which is Western democracies, is the is the is the light, and that the uh, closed societies, the autocracies and tyrannies of the East, are the darkness. Um, I wouldn't agree that far with George Soros, but definitely that we're witnessing a clash of uh, two models of governance. Um, as as Matthew has said, this this is this this progression has been evolving for centuries. I think it goes at least as far back as the 13th century Venice, but it probably goes farther than that as well. And uh, I think that the the greatest factor shaping this conflict is our monetary system, which has evolved from those roots in Venice. Uh, there are two elements to it that are that are toxic to human society. One is the fractional reserve banking, and the other one is fiat currency system. The fractional reserve banking means that banks can extend more credit than they actually have uh, loss loss absorbing assets on their on their books. And fiat currency means that the money that we use today is backed by nothing but debt. Uh, through history, and maybe, you know, it would be too much to go into a discussion of, of, of causes and reason, but two, two things emerge about this system of, uh, this monetary system of uh, fractional reserve banking with fiat currency, is that A, it's extremely crisis prone. So fractional reserve system generates artificial purchasing power 
where the bankers accept deposits once upon a time gold and then then lend out this gold because they quickly learned that most people when they deposit their gold to a place which they felt was secure they leave it there for a very long time and so if the bankers lend it out nobody's the wiser the effect of it is is that it adds purchasing power into an economic system it makes people more entrepreneurial it makes them feel more prosperous and so for a time this system kind of mobilizes the creative abilities that exist in the in the population and makes everybody think that they are better off which in reality they are the problem is that about half the time when you operate with this system it causes deep crises and once upon a time this would manifest itself simply in bank failures because when people felt that the bank is giving out their gold and that if they if they want to redeem their gold that it might not be there you had bank runs and banks would regularly fail uh, the banks would regularly fail under bank runs and then we had the advent of central banking which has uh, which has pretty much become the standards from the early 20th century across the world and uh, central banks are now in the position to bail out individual banks so we don't see bank runs so much anymore but this measure has not removed the the root causes of the crises so as we experience now we are in the crisis uh, this is not a new experience this monetary system has been crisis prone and through probably half of the of the, of the history with this system economies have been through crisis depressions recessions uh bankruptcies bank failures and so forth sometimes sometimes with extremely extremely tragic consequences uh world wars have followed banking crises uh when the lombard banking system failed in the in the 14th century italy uh the year after that there was the black plague which swept across the continent and killed about a third of the to 40 percent of the european population another another thing that goes along with this banking system is war so there's a dynamic associated with this banking system that causes societies to be very warlike not because individuals in the society enjoy going to war but because of the perverse incentives that exist in the system and i'll try to summarize this even though you know the the argument is a little bit complex but basically if you regard if you got if you regard an economic system as a as a as a system which produces over a period of time a certain amount of goods and services uh, all the costs that are associated with production of these good and, goods and services plus the entrepreneur's profits represent represents the purchasing power that is available in the system to purchase all the goods and services that have been produced so for this system to be in equilibrium the purchasing power the, the the prices attached to all the goods and services should match exactly the available and then all the businesses all the entrepreneurs could save the prices they actually doing fine now what happens is that this is never really the case because a people like to save some money for the rainy day and we see that throughout even in crisis and through with prosperity regardless 
the the people always retain a certain percentage of their discretionary income and set it aside for a rainy day. Now that means if if, if they do this, that the aggregate purchasing power that's available in the system will no longer be sufficient for all the businesses and entrepreneurs to sell their wares to the public at the prices that they expected and, and, and wanted. So that means that they will have to lower the prices. That means that uh, some of them might even have to curtail production, lay off some workers, uh, some businesses, mathematically, a, a percentage of businesses and people will go bankrupt, which will further reduce the purchasing power that's available in the system, which will then further reduce uh, production and, and output of goods. And so what you get is a self-reinforcing cycle that the economists call colloquially the deflationary death spiral. And savings are not the only feature that is leading to this there's also the fact that all the money that's in circulation uh is is a set is essentially reflects debt as businesses generate their revenues they also pay off their debts on a on a regular schedule when you pay debt you retire money, money disappears, right? Because the money in the, in the circulation only represents debt. It's no longer gold, it's no longer silver, it's not any kind of commodity, it's only debt. So when you repay your debt, that amount of money is taken out of, a, out of the system, it just disappears. So for this, as I mentioned, for the system to be in equilibrium, uh, the amount, the, the aggregate spending should match exactly the aggregate costs and expenses and entrepreneurs' profits. But the system actually needs to grow to be in balance. Why? Because the, exactly because of this fact that money is being retired. The money that's put in, into circulation reflects debt. It has to be paid back with interest. The amount of interest never goes into circulation. So the only way somebody who takes on debt could repay their debt plus interest, it can only be done if other people also take on debt so that there's more money in the system and more purchasing power. Now, this never works. That is, it works for a little while. You, 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 you prime the engine. It goes for a little while, usually a period of seven to 10 years. And then inevi inevitably, you know, the, the, the cycle of prosperity and, you know, everybody gets a home, everybody gets a car, everybody has nice clothes. And so the, the, the spending of all this prosperity levels off. And at that point, um, the system either stagnates or begins to go into a recession. And so to offset this, inevitably governments have to step in and to pump this supplemental purchasing power into the system uh, to keep it from entering that deflationary death spiral. Because if you let that process uh, unwind itself completely, the economy would eventually stabilize only at a depression level of activity. And what happens at that point is that as, the, as banks step in to add purchasing power into the system, choices have to be made. made how do we do this? And so you have many you have many choices. You know you can build uh, you can build libraries and schools and universities and hospitals. Uh, you can just distribute money to the people. Um, you can build monuments. You know you can build pyramids, for example. You can pay. You can spend money on space programs, and so on and so forth. Basically, um, 
goods that don't enter the market. Now, a lot of these, or, or also you can you can invest into 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 infrastructures like roads and bridges and uh, high high speed uh, railways and so forth. Unfortunately, all of these all of these good productive ideas tend to run into uh, ideological headwinds because in 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 the Western societies, we don't want governments involved in the in the economic uh, activity at all, because everybody knows that governments uh, don't do that well, that they're inefficient, corrupt, um, unprofitable, and so forth. So people practically as a knee-jerk reaction reject that. One thing that everybody can agree on, agree on usually, and if they don't agree on it, that they can always be bludgeoned into submission morally, is uh, national security and national defense. So, uh, you know, you can always contrive reasons why we should be uh, afraid of a certain uh, external enemy. We can always project their power to the minds of the populace. And we can always say, "Why well, we need we need bigger weapons. We need more money. We need more money in the in the in the weapons industries, in the military, and so forth." So you get this metastasizing military industrial complex, which also then over time becomes wealthy and powerful enough where they can even, you know, uh, control and co-opt and even uh, outright own the media. The media do their job to keep the people afraid of external enemies. And so we always have external enemies. We always have people to, to be afraid of, somebody who's uh, threatening us from abroad. And so you, the, the system gets to this point where you have a permanent state of war where the military industry is absolutely gargantuan. Madmen and enemies abroad are just one following the other. Um, this, this has a succession that spans decades. So, you know, the public can always be, you know, the worst can always be justified by presenting like, oh, Slobodan Milosevic is a monster, we have to go bomb Serbia. Um, Saddam Hussein is a monster, we have to save his people from him, and so we go to war to Iraq. Uh, the Taliban are monsters, we have to go into Afghanistan, and uh, Gaddafi is a monster, we have to go into Libya. And so one thing after another, these wars are always duly uh, explained and justified to the to the American people, uh, but the fact is that wars are always on. It's just one thing after another, and if you if you peel back the onion of where this comes from, because it clearly doesn't come from the inclinations of the American people who always vote for anti-war candidates, but always end up getting more war. If you peel that onion, onion all the way all, all the way back to its seed, it goes back to the monetary system, with you know with an element of of the cultural inclination because it's not you know a country again you know a country could choose to spend uh, that extra extra purchasing power on on pyramids or infrastructure or education or just leisure if you like. It doesn't have to be always war, but certain cultural inclinations make war the irresistible option. So we have a systemic addiction to war and hardly anyone analyzing why that is so and how we can end it. And my contention is that we can only end it by completely overhauling the monetary system and in fact, overhauling the entire operating system of the Western societies. The alternative of staying on this path and maintaining the status quo is, is total destruction. And we are going in that direction. I think that fortunately, uh, Western powers have now encountered a worthy enemy, a worthy adversary. And so that gravy train stops. 
And so I, I would I would leave it at that because then you know we can go into what happens after the gravy the gravy train stops and are the ruling uh, are the ruling powers that that be aware of that and what are there um, contingencies to deal with this with this uh, prospect and to mitigate the crisis and I'll just I'll just make the suggestion that they 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 have to introduce a new monetary system and to make the monetary system stick you know CBDCs central bank digital currencies and to make that monetary system stick they need a matrix of total control of their own population that's where the pandemic comes in and so on and so forth but basically uh if we passively acquiesce to everything that's coming our way we will gift our children and their children a future and a life that's not worth living so we we have no option to acquiesce because it's on somebody else's um it's going to it's going to affect our uh um, our children and our grandchildren all right so thank you and uh, i would leave it at that and then maybe more in we can we can uh, go into more interesting topics uh, in uh, in the discussion Absolutely, yes. And thank you for those very, very poignant and very, very important remarks. And I think that's a great place to end it in an open way. Um, Pascal, I know, has a question which feeds directly off of uh, the points that you just made towards your closing remarks. Um, I'll just ask everybody again, please put your, your names in the chat box. Try to be as concise as you can, since we only have maybe 45, 50 minutes left. Um, Pascal, go for it. It's all yours. Okay, thank you, Matthew. Thank you, Mr. Kreiner, uh, for your remarks. Um, I I listened to your the uh, the Road News show where you intervened also with uh, with Matthew, and that was a, a very interesting uh, uh, discussion. Um, I've been thinking since I've seen that show um, that, as you mentioned, uh, right now our system is broken, and so there is no correlation between reality. Uh, the state of the physical economy and our financial system and the financial tools that are used to try to prop it up. Uh, we're running into a, a very huge crisis. And when I look at the news, you know, coming from uh, Europe, uh, I don't think that they're going to they're going to have a very good Christmas period or a very good winter uh, due to the energy crisis that's coming. But on top of that, you also have the food crisis. Um, you know, uh, my question is more regarding that new system. Since we need a new system, I would go back to, you know, after World War II, we had the Bretton Woods Agreement, which were signed by the victors of the war. Uh, we seem to be in a war right now also, but the victors are not uh, the ones that maybe we would have hoped uh, or, you know, as, as changed side in the world. So I don't see the West as being the ones that can actually bring forth a new system, even though they are on the failing side and would require, would need one. Do you see that a new Bretton Woods system would be more of the prerogative of Russia and China and the Eurasian bloc right now? And how, how do, yeah, how do you think that could work? Well, it seems to me that Russia and China have been actively working on creating something along those those lines, like a new Bretton Woods system, for uh, quite a while now. And uh, they've always they've also been, uh, well, I think pretty much since June they've announced that that system is is coming. I don't know when exactly, but. Um, it's it's a very interesting thing to observe because one thing I learned about that is that uh, Russian and Chinese diplomats have been signaling to their to their potential partners, uh, you know, nations who might uh, come into this system that they would not be penalizing them for um, for defaulting on the their obligations to the Western financial institutions and they would not be penalizing them for. Um, for nationalizing their national industries and resources 
And now, uh, last week, we've seen that Burkina Faso has actually begun the process of nationalizing their um, nat natural resources and their mining industries development that I don't believe that we will see much about in the in the in the new cycle at least not in the in the western media. but accelerates the financial crisis in the west because the you know control over let's say Burkina Faso's uh, gold mines and zinc mines and copper mines and so forth actually represents collateral on the books of western banks uh losing that collateral losing access and control of that collateral uh, is moving those banks closer to failure and they're already well on their way to failing you know so it's a question of how much longer they can be bailed out and I think that the only way that you can bail them out is just like it's just by printing uh, fiat to paper over the bad debts uh, of these failing corporations uh, uh, and and the holes that are materializing on the books of the banks. And that only leads to one outcome and is the collapse of the currency through hyperinflation. So that's the direction in which the West is moving. Now, who is the West? We today have um, leaders power doesn't mean that they'll be in power six months from now or a or year from now and uh, you know the west is actually us and we don't have to passively sit and watch and wait what our exalted leaders are going to do we have we have problems to address among other things we have to figure out how we're going to exchange services among each other when you know money no longer comes out of the atms and generally you know people historically people have been very inventive very creative to, in addressing those problems and finding solutions you know and you know during during the during the depression during the weimar inflation in germany 100 years ago uh alternative local and regional currencies have popped out like popped up like mushrooms all over the place because people just simply needed them and so they they came up with them uh you know bottom bottom up but we have to be prepared that such uh such measures to mitigate crises will be necessary and then we'll probably have to defend our right to grow our food you know because they clearly want us to eat a diet of insects and they want to you know they they pretty much laid it out in the open that they want to phase out uh, uh, cattle farming, um, uh, lamb, and other kinds of farming in favor of, 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 of insects and whatnot. The, uh, the old adage, fate leads the willing and the unwilling drags. So hopefully the unwilling technocrats who are or part of this death cult might be dragged into a uh, <laughs> a better orientation. Maybe not. Maybe that won't necessarily tra transform their hearts, but at least force them to behave according to some standards that are in conjunction with human, you know, actual humanity. So we'll see. Um, got a question here from uh, Peter. Peter, you're next on the list. You're, you're also on mute. Sorry. Every everyone's on mute. Unmuted. Alex, I have a question that uh, addresses uh, Croatian history. Was the U.S. NATO support of Croatia in Krajina in 1995 a precursor for the U.S. NATO support of Ukraine in 2014 through 2022, or even more properly, before 2014? More importantly, what did the U.S. and NATO learn from Krajina that they are directly applying in Ukraine at the present? Hi, Peter. Thank you for that question. Uh, it's a, it's an extremely interesting question, and I don't think that it's it, the, the parallels are quite uh, appropriate because, you know, uh, NATO NATO did support Croatia um, in 1995, but when the war broke out, 
1991, they didn't. You know, that was there was like a 180 degree turn turnabout because, you know, initially they wanted to keep Yugoslavia as a as 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 one nation as their as their client controlled through Belgrade. But uh, most of the republics wanted to well, we you know, we wanted initially a confederation. We were denied that. Um in in 1991, the war broke out because uh, first Slovenia, then Croatia, then Bosnia, then others declared their independence. Uh, the 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 authorities in in uh, in Belgrade were signaled by the U.S. administration that they support uh, the the you know the lawful government and that they support Yugoslavia as a single country. So Yugoslavian army attacked. And then we had a frozen conflict, not for you know, not for eight years, but for about uh, for about four years. And Krajina, about thirty five percent of Croatia was uh, occupied by uh, the 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 you know the the Serbian forces. And then you know political changes happened, and then there was a there was obviously a change of heart. Uh, Croatia obviously offered itself as a better client to the West, and so they supported us in reconquering those 35%. Um, but, you know, Croatia, neither Croatia nor Yugoslavia, you know, while, while they had some strategic significance, you know, occupying the western coast of the Adriatic, um, we didn't have such very very high um, strategic importance because you know Ukraine is actually the ideal staging ground for uh, dragging Russia into a quagmire and weakening Russia and then maybe hopefully leading to a to a to a regime change in Moscow. Mm, I think that our part of the world never had such uh, critical importance for them. So they played it one way, then they changed their mind, then they played it another way. Uh, what was actually behind all that, I have to tell you, because I, I even participated in that war uh, uh, as, a, as a Croatian soldier. Um, you know, the similarity is that we probably felt like the Ukrainians now that we were fighting for our freedoms even though the puppet masters were all in London and, and in, in, in Washington. So, you know, th there are some similarities, but it's a, it's a very, very different, uh, very, very different kind of war. Thank you very much. Faisal? You have to just unmute uh, yourself. Hi, thanks for that, Matt. Um, Alex, uh, pleasure to meet you uh, online. It's Faisal from Canada. We've uh, Hi, exchanged some uh, emails. So thanks again for the uh, yeah. It's it's the it's the same. Oh, guy. cool! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I, thank you for those emails. I, I really enjoyed uh, reading them. Okay, I'm glad. I'm glad, and uh, uh, nice to uh, be able to connect with you. So. Um, great explanation on the deflationary gap. It's uh, the second time I've heard you explain it. So it's actually sinking in uh, deeper into the brain cells. Um, so the BRICS and Sergei Glaziev, they're talking about uh, a new monetary system that's asset based, right? Right. How would an asset based uh, monetary system avoid a deflationary gap, if at all? And if it doesn't, what what else is required in order to make it a more sustainable and less war prone? Well, okay, so you know you have you have several version of goods, and that is actually you you know you had you had the, the for example, farmers simply don't harvest their crops, they just let them rot in the field. Or sometimes they're even plowed in. Uh, one of the ways of dealing with the deflationary gap is the production capacity that's available in the, in the economy. Um, you can also 
choose to produce goods that don't enter the market, you know, pyramids, for example, you know, you build a pyramid, you, you, you spend a lot of money to build it, but it never goes on sale. So that purchasing power gets into the system, but it doesn't have to be matched with, with a purchase on the other side. And you can also, you know, obviously build bombs and stuff, but, you know, my, my reading of history, which, you know, I'm not a historian, so I, I, I don't claim authority on this, but, you know, one thing that I picked up from Carol Quigley is that the Western civilization, so I'm not just talking about the Americans or even the Brits, but this whole, let's call it 500 years of history where this, you know, fractional reserve fraudulent, fraudulent banking has taken hold and has started defining relationships and incentives in the society. We have wiped out six major indigenous civilizations around the world. You know, the South American ones, India, China, Japan. And we have wiped out uh, literally thousands of smaller kingdoms, cultures, tribes, uh, that lived at a very fairly high level of civilization earth you know to the tune of 80 90 percent and in some cases 100 percent you know like the indigenous tribes that occupy the caribbean islands no longer exist they've been completely wiped out and replaced with african slaves and so again you know you know this is not because western europeans are inherently evil but because we have adopted a system that incentivizes the worst of behaviors. Um, the Chinese and the Indians, who have been the global economic superpowers for centuries before, you know, the Western European colonists emerged, they haven't gone around the world colonizing and depopulating other civilizations and other cultures. So there is a cultural element where, you know, um, I think, you know, we've seen Chinese build out, what, 20, 30,000 kilometers of high speed, speed rail networks. Um, their military spending is still relatively insignificant. Russian military spending is, is relatively high, but for good reasons. But then again, you know, they've also, they also inv invest in in you know improving their society and creating you know producing in the productive industrial potential, improving the infrastructure and so forth. So the inclinations at the moment are are different from what they are in the West, and also we see that the political leadership, both in Russia and in China, are superimposed. To to the corporate oligarchy. So, you know, we, you have oligarchs in China, you have oligarchs in Russia, but Xi Jinping can, can uh, curtail their power and Vladimir Putin can also curtail their power. So that whole, the whole system of incentives where somebody maybe uh, works out that war is awesome for business, so let's just buy up all the newspapers and pitch war after war after war to get more and more and more money for our uh, weapons industries that dynamic hasn't yet happened in Russia or in China. And we've even seen examples where, you know, the Chinese leadership uh, simply uh, removes APD oligarchs. You know, Jack Ma strayed into criticizing the Chinese banking system and then he disappeared. You know, he's, he's enjoying his wealth somewhere, but he's no longer all over media uh, preaching about how to run things. So longer term view, just to wrap this, longer term view, I think we have to get away from this kind of monetary system at all because it shouldn't, it shouldn't rest on, on, on the benevolence of the people in power. You know, we, we, need, we need maybe better, um, better protections from, uh, from potential abuse that comes with the great, great privilege of being able to issue credit and allocate it and choose who gets it, who doesn't get it. Okay. So if I understand correctly, just a, a simple migration to an asset-based away from a debt-based system doesn't necessarily resolve the civilization. No, no, I, no I, 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 
I don't think it does, Faisal, because you know, uh, back for until until at some point in the last century, we we've had gold standard. We had some you know variation yeah. of gold standards, uh, and it hasn't it hasn't changed much. You know, uh, uh, the Spanish Empire was using gold, but it didn't change the fact that they wiped out the Aztecas and Mayas and um, the Incas in the south in in, in South America. Um, when when the Bank of England was established in 1694, next 120 years, they were in 18 officially um, declared wars against France, which was their major rival. And then they finally took care of France through the French Revolution. But, you know, that war dynamic was there even when the money was gold-backed. So that's not necessarily what changes the dynamic. Right. Yeah. Fair point. Thank you. That's good. Thank you, Faisal. Thank you, Faisal. That was good. Um, yeah. And obviously, the the question is there. We, we often will look for a mechanism um, or formula that could solve like a magic uh, spell mm -hmm. all of our problems. But obviously, when we look to history, that never works. And there's always a question of the the cultural, moral. Uh, dynamic, which is shaping how society comes to its relationship with itself, right? How we we shape our identities, shape our values, and that's really at the at the heart of everything. As they say, politics and economics is downstream from culture, and I think that's what you've sort of been alluding to, Alex. Um, Jerry, I uh, know that you've been waiting for a while. Yes, thanks, Matt. Uh, thanks, Alex. That was a nice uh, bit of fresh air. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Gerald. <laughs> and uh, I, I like your uh, your idea of this self reinforcing deflationary cycle because I agree. I you see it out there. I think the purchasing power of the average person is going down. But at the same time as we have that, we also have the growth of these like multi billionaires. You know, like Amazon and. Elon Musk and that, and I've had like arguments with friends of mine and um, see, they think, well, that shows that the economy is going great, that you can have these billionaires, it, it must be going good. And I say, <laughs> well, I say, it's not that they're so smart, they're just better thieves. It's, it's kind of a simple uh, explanation, but just this idea, you have this deflationary cycle but at the same time you have the growth of these uh multi-billionaires and i was just wondering what your uh your view your analysis of this this kind of contradiction is well i don't, I don't think it's necessarily a contradiction is they're they're both i think they're both uh, symptoms of a, of a of a broken system you know and in what you know one thing you learn uh about the western societies is that all these well, the vast majority of all these oligarchs are not where they are because they were the cleverest, the fastest, the most, most creative uh, of the lot, but because somebody it's in some, you know, somebody in some place paved their way and they have protection in high places. And the more you know about them, the more you realize that they were basically handed their privileges and those privileges were handed usually in exchange for certain obligations. Yeah. So, you know, Bill Gates was, uh, you know, his, his father was already a relatively well-connected, powerful man. His mother was uh, close to the board of directors of IBM when he got the, you know, contract for the DOS uh, operating system when they launched their PC line. And so a lot of these, and he didn't invent anything, you know, he even, he even, bought the DOS operating system from somebody else who actually wrote it. How did he know to do that? You know, so, you know, Steve Jobs was connected in, in, in these ways, you know, you've, we've, we've just seen this FTX thing collapse. It turns out that the fried bankman was also um, politically connected and handed his wealth basically. And so, that is none of that is a reflection of a healthy 
prosperous growing economy. It's only a reflection that uh, the political elite chooses winners and losers. And then these winners are also used as a prop to show you, well, you see, if you play by the rules, if you work hard, <laughs> if you take risks, then you too can be a billionaire, maybe. Uh, but in fact, you know, uh, I, we also know that the social mobility in, in Western countries is actually very, very low and that it's much higher in some of these other countries like China. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of mythology. There's a lot of mythology. Uh, the presence of billionaires and even, even the, um, you know, the march of the stock markets do not reflect the actual economy the, st the stock market is the 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 one and this you know like like the deflationary gap it took me practically all my life to work this out even though it's it's once you work it out you realize it's obvious the the main factor moving the stock markets is central bank monetary inflation when central banks qes quantitative easing, right? Stock markets go, go up. When they slow it down or contract the money supply, stock markets go down. And we have now more than a century of data showing this, that this, this relationship moves in parallel. And the people who are at the top of our monetary, you know, near the top of the monetary authorities, they know this. They know this perfectly well. So they can they can even create authorities like like Warren Buffett because they know when to get into the markets they know when to get out it's 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 unfortunately that simple but it's not simple for the rest of us because a they never tell us these things you know I studied economics I was like the geek's geek you know I I, I took the whole thing very seriously I tried to know everything about it. I've never heard of the deflationary gap in my university studies. And I still have my economics textbooks. They don't mention it. So certain things are definitely obscure, obscured from us. And this, you know, uh, mm, facade of economic prosperity and uh, this, this, is, this is contrived so that, you know, people don't rise up and say, like, this whole system doesn't work. We have to change it. You, you know, you have to go along with the system. You have to work hard to contribute to it. And, you know, let, let, them, let them choose who wins and who doesn't. I think part of that might have something, something to do with the fact that the system under under the the influence of the actual political operatives that we know and have identified have been trying to operate above above you know the nations above the system often will create rules that they never themselves intended to follow but rather know that to the degree that people are dumb enough to follow the the rules of correct economic behavior they are going to be easily controllable. Um, so you're dealing with dishonest actors, whereby you know the words free trade, other things, they sound all well and nice on the surface until you get an opium war, you get a controlled starvation or famine. And then you're like, maybe yes. that was actually the intention, actually. Maybe that was actually the, <laughs> the effect because those uh, actual agents never, never played or never intended to play by their own fair, you know, free trade rules themselves in an honest yeah. way. Yeah, I think I think that's correct, man. The um, next question we have here, uh, and by the way, uh, I got a question here for time time constraint wise. You said quarter past is your absolute dead cutoff. Yep. Yeah, well, you know, dead cutoff. I'm not. I'm not. You know, uh, they're not going to come for me. You know, and uh, <laughs> but uh, I have to. You know, I have. You know, my I have two small kids, ten and twelve. Yeah. They have school tomorrow morning, so I have to like pack them up, make sure that they have all the stuff, and okay. they have to be in bed early enough to. Because uh... we got we have about eight questions, we're not going to get through them. But is it okay if I give your your email address to people? Um, yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, I'm going to put that in the chat. I'll, I'll just say, 
I'll just say if you don't hear from me in a few days, I, I do I do get around to answering emails eventually. But if I don't, please don't be shy about reminding me because uh, I, some 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 slip through the through the oversight uh, valve. So we have uh, Adria. Cora, are you still there? Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for calling on me. I'll try to be quick then. Uh, first of all, just briefly to say how much I really loved your presentation on Theranos. That was so oh, brilliant. Thank you. Uh, you know, she was just sentenced on Friday. Yes. To All right. Um, I also just wanted to quickly say, because I saw Gerald's on the phone, how much I enjoyed the Robert Frost presentation. It was amazing. My question is in regards to two items. One, you mentioned the FTX. And um, following that debacle, really pretty swiftly, if I'm not mistaken, the New York Federal Reserve has now launched a central um, bank digital currency that I think City, City and also Bank of New York Mellon and some others are also involved in this rollout. Some people have said that it's potentially this kind of, you know, Hegelian move where, you know, you introduce something in order to say like, well, you demonize the, you know, FTX as like outsider or something, you know, and then you say, well, the government is going to do a better job and it's going to be safer for you. And then, so you, you, you pose the problem then you pose the potential solution, but the solution is actually the problem. Um, relative to that, um, President Trump is someone who, or ex-President Trump is someone who I just don't understand. Uh, I'm not a supporter nor a critic. I'm just confused about him, but in general, uh, I know that he has had, you know, a history of litigation with banks, with not only Deutsche Bank, but so many banks. And, um, you know, he comes out of this history of, of knowing the tax code. His father played the tax code. He won't reveal his taxes. He's now somehow intimated in a speech, or so it was reported in the Epic Times yesterday, that his son Eric has now ceased becoming a citizen of the United States and is now like a, a citizen of the state of New York or potentially Florida um, and is maybe not going to pay taxes. You know, there's this apparent movement now um, to try to get around being a citizen of the United States Inc., like an, an incorporation of the United States to become not a question. Um, it, it's a fascinating article. Matthew, I think you could also speak to this. The article is November 19th in the New York Times, in the Epic Times. The USA Inc. reporter exposes how America was hijacked, turned into a corporation during the Civil War. And it really focuses on this person. She's a 55 year old reporter and she's chairman of the Zelenko Freedom Foundation. That's Dr. Z Zelenko who passed away recently. Um, her name is Anne Vandersteel, and she's talking about sh how she gave up her own U.S. citizenship to become um, a, a state. She's, she now doesn't pay taxes and, and what have you. So, you know, Trump also just recently announced his candidacy. These things are happening concurrently, and I think it, it needs to be mentioned that the Bank of New York is now, you know, 40 Wall Street is the Trump build. So I don't really know how to put all of these things together if there is any kind of connecting any of these things, but it seems like everything's happening at once in this whirlwind. So I would love to hear your comments on it. Thank you, Adria. Um, look, I, to be honest, I don't really know what to make of, of all this. I'm aware of uh, Ms. Van der Steel, right? Uh, and uh, I know that she's the chairman of the Zelenko Foundation, and I know that there's this movement um, of uh, using these uh, laws of admiralty to, you know, that the United States has been hijacked, that it's been turned into a corporation. I think this is broadly, you know, correct, but I think it flies over too many people's heads. I mean, you know, uh, ooh. You, if you go to court and you prove these things, and then what happens? Nothing, I think. In my mind, nothing really happens. And the world goes on. There is, you know, there's no law without law enforcement. 
And so who's going to enforce these things? I don't know. And, but I, you know, like I do think that um, uh, it's, it's probably a good thing that people are re-examining these arrangements, that they are unearthing uh, the plumbing under the system, because, you know, when it crumbles, we have to replace it with somebody, with something. So we have to be aware of uh, what's under the hood. Trump, like you, I don't exactly know how to read him, but after four years of his, his presidency, I've learned to give him the benefit of the doubt because a lot of the things that he has done that on the surface appearance of it seemed dumb or disappointed ultimately proved um, much more interesting than that. And I think the one thing that he has been doing, one thing that he has been doing consistently is he has been rolling back the empire. He has been extricating the United States from being the, the military muscle of the, of the empire. And so, you know, he cannot come out openly and say that because he will turn everyone into his enemy. You know, like all the banks and all the corporations are the stakeholders in this empire. So he cannot say it out loud and openly. But, you know, when he launches a rocket attack on Syria, informs the Russians an hour in advance, and then all these rockets fall on an empty parking lot, or not, not even all of them, but, but half of them, and the other half never even reaches the target. Minimal damage. So he gives... Um, he gives a bone to the to the military industrial complex and all the cold warriors who say like, oh yeah, now he's finally presidential, but ultimately nothing changed, nothing happened. He tried to take US troops from out of, out of Syria, from out of Afghanistan, from out of Germany even. He was unable to do that, but he did try. So anyway, long story short, I give him the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, and I just wanted to interject. He also, if I'm not mistaken, it professed his admiration for Andrew Jackson, whom I'm learning was the last president to actually pay down the debt. Yeah, but I think that he, uh, yeah, you know, it's it's thanks to thanks to Matthew Matthew Eret, among others that I learned not to admire Andrew Jackson quite as much as I used to. <laughs> That question, Andrea. Um, Monty has been waiting for a bit. Uh, Monty, go for it. And again, we'll have to keep the questions uh, dense, short, punchy. Go for it. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Alex. Uh, very quickly, there, there's still a lot of back and forth on this Andrew Jackson thing and uh, central banking versus a national bank. Often the two are conflated. Uh, so, uh, but my question, I've heard the argument made that a strict gold standard resumption of a species act would restrict uh, the government from being able to issue credit as opposed to a gold reserve standard, which we used to have, which would still maintain uh, our ability of the government to, to stabilize the currency somewhat and, and yet not restrict the ability of the United States to issue credit uh, for infrastructure projects and productivity. Do you have any comments on that? Well, I, I don't know that that's where it's at, you know, because the United States, if it if it wants to issue credit for construction of um, of uh, of infrastructure, for example, they can they can issue the government bonds, you know, they can they can they can print the currency. It doesn't have to be even backed by anything, you know. It can be it can be backed by the future future by the value of the future infrastructure. So, you know, whether you're on a 100% gold standard or, uh, you know, partial gold, you know, gold exchange standard or gold reserve standard isn't necessarily, you know, the, 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 those are various levels of restriction on, on government or better yet, banking abuse of the system. You know, like if, if, you're, if you're on a full gold standard, it's very hard to abuse the system, but they would nevertheless. If you're on a gold exchange standard, it's easier to abuse the systems, and they will even more. And if you're on a total fiat system, then they'll abuse it even more. But you know that's not necessarily where you would um, shut down or disable or disincentivize abuse. I think that the 
disincentivizing abuse needs to come from the decision about not how much credit is created, but what it's created for. Mm. Very good. Um, Mo Adam Sedia, are you still there? Adam, can yes, you hear me? I am. Yes, oh. I am. Um, real Hi. quick, I know we just touched on it uh, very briefly, but I, I've been following this FTX uh, scandal with a lot of interest, particularly with the um, using investor funds uh, to, which in former days were sacrosanct uh, as a slush fund. And it reminds me of the MF global collapse from 10 some odd years ago. I was just wondering if you had more thoughts about that and how it impacts the larger picture you talked about. Um, thank you, Adam. I, I, I don't necessarily have a very strong opinion of that, except that, you know, we've, we've, we're clearly going from scandal to scandal to scandal to scandal. And it's not, yeah, you, you, you recalled well the MF Global, but there were others, you know, there was the Theranos, there was a WorldCom, Enron, um, Lehman Brothers, uh, Bear Stearns. It's just one thing after another, you know, the, the abuse of the system has been made possible also by the gutting of the SEC regulation and enforcement agency uh, during the, the Bush Jr. administration. You know, they, they practically took out all the, all the financial fraud investigators. I think that they reduced it from 100 people to maybe three people. They chose the three least competent ones. And so, you know, there hasn't been much enforcement. There hasn't been much regulation. Um, we knew that from the Bernie uh, Madoff scandal that, you know, I forget the gentleman's name, but somebody who has extensively documented the Bernie Madoff uh, Ponzi scheme and tried again and again to get the SEC to investigate and to put an end to that fraud, they basically ignored him and let the fraud carry on. So uh, yeah, the government structures have been made. Uh, yeah, Markopoulos, thank you very much. <laughs> Harry, Harry Markopoulos blew the whistle on, on, her, on Bernie Madoff well, well in advance of the of the of the Ponzi scheme imploding, but he was ignored and Bernie, Bernie Madoff was enabled to carry on. And Bernie Madoff had Bernie Madoff had his banking contacts that also uh, pretending like they they couldn't work out that anything was amiss and they continued to cooperate. The system is rife with corruption and abuse, and uh, you know it's not it's not whether we have. You know the money is gold backed or not it you know the system needs rigorous uh regulation and very tough enforcement the chinese execute their bankers and uh, you know i'm not in favor of a death penalty but there should be 100 percent expropriation and very long prison sentences as it is in the western world no white collar worker goes to prison, except a few individuals here and there, the proverbial heads to roll to, you know, make, make people go to sleep again pre to pretend that, you know, somebody was punished and now everything is good. Thank you. Um, Faltia is asking me to write or to uh, read aloud the question or, or Faltia, would, would you like to uh, ask your own question or do you want me to read it for you? Uh, you you're on mute. Hi. <laughs> yeah. I just got home. So <laughs> coming from Zurich to my house. Um, I have another question now because the uh, conversation is so interesting that um, let me just turn on the light. I just wanted to ask about um, the whole 
gold standard and not gold standard because Alex mentioned like the Spanish empire and how they went to South America and basically eliminated all the tribes there. But the question is, how did they even get that far? Because um, I think all those uh, empires needed loans to even take on these undertakings. And they were basically, all this is basically usury. And um, I think most of these people, most of you, I mean, uh, I'm a Muslim, so in the Quran, it says Allah has made war on, war on usury and he's allowed commerce. So when usury comes into the equation, which is, you know, charging interest, that leads to another thing, which leads to another, and that takes us basically to the situation that we're in now. So most religions in their origins forbade usury. So um, all these kings and empires, they all had to borrow on usury and Shakespeare made a very good play on that. So what are Alex's views on this observation? Hi Fazia, thank you for the question. That's that's actually a fascinating area. And I've been I've been kind of working gradually to work all that out. So I know that um you know Ferdinand and Isabella, the kings of uh, of Spain that were Habsburgs, they were basically um, third-rate nobility from some region of Spain. They were actually not very wealthy at all. They were not even able to afford the cost of their wedding. That was covered by bankers from, I think, Germany, Switzerland, Italy, like that. Uh, I mm -hmm. think maybe Jacob Fugger was one of the bankers who uh, brought... Uh, Isabella and Ferdinand to power and they then you know they they began to fund these uh, adventurers who were sailing across the ocean into South America and they did what they did there plundered tremendous amounts of gold and silver uh, put the locals into slavery to you know extract more gold and gold and silver where they thought they could find it and basically ended up wiping out those civilizations. Uh, the, the king and queen of Spain were the creation of the bankers. And the thing that fascinates me about that period is that um, I actually couldn't work out how that could happen, not because, not because of the usury, which you're absolutely correct to point out. But, you know, it's the thing I found there was, you know, like in the, in the Middle Ages in Italy, there was this... Uh, discussion about usury what's usury what's not usury and the bankers would always find loopholes and ways to go around it they would create these uh complicated trading contracts where you know they ended up charging usury but making it look like it was uh, margins on exchange of goods between you know whatever turkey and venice and england and bruges and the uh, you know different ports around the Mediterranean. It's not it's not only the usury that's problem. It's the fractional banking that's also the problem because, you know, like it's one thing if you ask me, Alex, can you lend me a hundred bucks? And I say like, sure, Fazia, here's a hundred buck. Please pay me back hundred and ten next year. So that's usury. But what if I go to my printer and I print a hundred bucks and give it to you and I say just return me a hundred bucks in a year from now. You know, mm -hmm. both are problematic, but I think the fractional reserve banking is even more problematic than the, than, than, than usually, you know, it, either case, yes, that creates a cascading system of incentives that then make these desperate adventures go and do things that they would never do in their own community. Mm -hmm. But they can do it, you know, somewhere across the ocean because maybe no nobody would know about it. You know, they used to say there's no sin below the equator. And uh, then that creates a dynamic of its own. And people who people whose morals, whose ethics don't allow them to do will, you know, just simply not participate in it. But you always find in the population people who don't mind. And so they will. You know, so you had, I mean, the Spaniards um, for over over a century and, and something, I think something like 250,000 Spaniards went across the ocean because 
you know, there was this story about the immense wealth of the South American um, civilizations that was propagated deliberately through the Spanish society in that time. And, you know, like when these, when these galleys arrived to, 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 um, to Spain loaded with silver and gold, people lost their minds. People mm -hmm. went and signed up for the, for the next expedition and the bankers were just there, you know, choosing who to fund and who not to fund. And the profits on these expeditions was something like if a successful expedition would return something like 70 times return on investment. Piracy, you know, mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. you know, that that drew people to the industry. And at the same time, selected for people willing to do what was what was necessary to do or what was, you know, expedient to do. Thank you. <laughs> There's many, many creative ways to steal. <laughs> the um, do we have time for maybe two more questions, Alex? What do you what do you? Yeah. OK, let's do two more. Two more. OK. All right. So uh, yeah. CJ is hosting. He's, he's live streaming this to uh, another channel. Uh, one of the questions came in uh, from CJ. So CJ, do you want to do you want to read it aloud or do you want me to read it? Just read it for time uh, constraints. Okay, please. I just got to scroll up and find it again. I uh, kind of got lost. Good to see Alex. Shots. I can read it. I can go through it if you want, Matthew. It's Would you? Quicker. Yeah, I can't yeah, find it. Absolutely. So, Alex, uh, thank you for being here. And my question is, is that in regards to the overhaul of the financial and economic system, can that be accomplished without first the overhaul of some of the political establishments, primarily in the West, uh, in, in the United States? Is that is that feasible at all? Uh, no, I think I think that we would have to have a, a, also a political overhaul of the political system. Uh, you know, and I think that the, 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 the problem is precisely because, you know, like in places like China or, and Russia, you know, uh, you can call them autocratic regimes uh, to an extent they are, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's an authority figure at the top of the pyramid who has very robust uh, public support and who can guide issues in a certain way and have their trust and confidence to go along with things even if they don't understand exactly the complexity of the of the of the issue so you know in russia you have something like uh, 70 some percent of the people who support vladimir putin uh, approve of his job and something less than that, but usually it's, it's, it's 10 to 15% less than that of people who express that they actually trust him. So they can say like, you know, I, I don't exactly understand this, but if, the, if, if Mr. Putin says that we should do X, Y, Z, then let's give X, Y, Z a chance. Uh, and then, you know, the media and the banking establishment and the rest of the government will fall into line. And if they don't, then, you know, they will be uh, disadvantaged or whatever. They won't be able to, to, uh, to participate in the, in the overhaul. In the West, unfortunately, it's the, it's the people who have the vested interest in the, in the status quo who are shaping up the, the, the narrative, the solutions, and everything else. So, you know, the, the political authority is actually subordinate to the economic interests. So if the, you know, like if the Prime Minister Liz Truss tries to push some measures that the oligarchy doesn't like, well, she's out of there, you know? And if Donald Trump wants to uh, implement some measures that, um, are not to the liking of the oligarchy. Well, you know, they 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 just steal the election, and that's that. So in the West, unfortunately, the effective control of the solutions that can be implemented and explored is in the hands of the people who have the vested interest in the status quo. And one thing we know about these people is that they will they will risk they will set the world on fire to keep control over their privileges rather than giving up any small part of it. Yep. Thank you for that, Alex. Thank you, CJ.
Uh, Stephen Doyle. Are you, are you there? There you are. Yep, I'm here. Thanks, Alex. Super lecture, and I'll, I'll try to be as quick as I can. Um, Thank you, Steve. I, I've read a number of uh, experts in the silver, physical silver space, who believe that that commodity will be the Achilles heel of the current financial system. So the next Lehman's moment won't happen at FTX or Credit Suisse or Deutsche Bank. They feel it will happen uh, when there's a massive short squeeze and all these uh, derivatives from silver and futures contracts can't be delivered to. Uh, as part of that, there's a group on Reddit called Wall Street Silver, and it's basically a, a mom and pop activist type thing where everyone is dedicated to devoting as much of their personal wealth and disposable income towards buying and holding physical silver with the hope that they will drain the inventories or help drain them and and cause that big uh, short squeeze price explosion do you feel that silver could be the catalyst for change and if so do you think that this everyday person activist activism in wall street silver is a wise thing to pursue or worthy okay so uh, thank you for the question Stephen. i i do follow wall street silver on twitter and, and i think they have very good posts i i, I like them uh, whether silver is the the silver bullet to the system, I, I I wouldn't go that far because I think that there could be many catalysts, and we've seen, you know, over the last years particularly, you know, like we've seen many many commodities go into this sharp uh, hockey stick um, appreciation, and then either they kind of stay in the zone or they correct sharply. Uh, it's very hard to say, you know, all commodities are very sen sensitive to liquidity conditions in the markets, you know, and, uh, you know, even, even in conditions where you have normally a, a strong demand for some commodity, say oil, a bottom can fall out in the, in a very short time, you know, so we've seen oil several times over the past 15 years crashed by 70% or, 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 or so, you know, 60, 70%. Uh, this happens because, you know, the, the, the whole system is very sensitive to the, to the liquidity in the market. Commodities themselves are very small part of the financial system. You know, you have, I don't know, uh, the market for, for gold, for example, which is, I think, bigger than the market for silver in terms of dollars is, I think, about $10, $10 trillion. If you take all of it, but the 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 um, shadow banking system is more than two hundred trillion dollars, so it's you know it's enough for some segment of the shadow banking system to start thinking that some some asset is interesting, or that they want to get out of some asset for enormous price swings. But I do think it's a very good idea to own some physical gold and silver. And I wouldn't, you know, I also wouldn't suggest for people to go out and hoard it because, you know, like there's a, there's even a men mental process that goes along with it. Once you start buying something that you start, you know, like it, it almost creates a thing of its own where you want to buy more and more and more and more. And that reinforces your conviction and your conviction pushes you to buy more. And the more you buy, the more you believe it. And, you know, like at some point you want to stay like, wait a minute, you know, uh, let's just diversify. Let's have a little bit of gold, a little bit of silver. Let's try to have a little, a little plot of land. Uh, let's have a little bit in real estate. You know, I think that it's very important to, to diversify. And then, you know, whether whether any one single factor will prove uh, to be the undoing of the system, I, I, I can't really say. I think, I think too many things are uh, coming down at the same time. So, you know, something might trigger an acceleration in the, in the decline, but the whole thing is rotten throughout. So, uh, yeah, I think that holding silver is is a good idea whether silver will be the 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 the, 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 the straw that breaks the camel's back i think it's anybody's guess okay. thank you thank you thank you alex and uh, i know that we uh, we've run through the uh, the time allotment that we had uh there's like something like 13 other 
questions and a lot of them are really good oh. questions that I've seen. And it's unfortunate that we can't really go through them today, but everyone has Alex's email now. And they also have Alex's Substack, which are in the chat box. Um, there'll also be in the recording of this video in the description box. So please subscribe to, to Alex. Feel free to pose your question to Alex. CC me as well. Love to see the Alex's answer. And if I could chime in, I'll, I'll say something useful if I can. Um, I think, you know, just listening to you today, Alex, it, it sort of reminded me a little bit of that, that allegory of, or the, the, the story of, of Noah and how, you know, a lot of people didn't understand what Noah was doing and just capacity building, learning, like, we're like, we're in a desert. What do you, what are you learning how to build a boat for? Well, what do we need to, that skill set? It's like, I, I feel like I'm going to need it. <laughs> you, yeah, should not, yeah, you shouldn't yeah, be wasting yeah. your time either. You should be building capacities as well. Keep flexible. And uh, I think we're in a situation today where people have wasted a lot of time. Um, you know, it's been part of the consumer society dynamic that we've adapted into. That was just, it's not necessarily our fault. That was the norms that we uh, modulated ourselves to. It involved, um, again, wasting a lot of time, not actualizing the, the mental powers that we've had endowed within us as potentials to be worked upon to develop a love for wisdom. So now's a time where we really, I think, need to take this opportunity to just immerse ourselves in, again, capacity build, learn, learn techniques, keep flexible. And so we don't know the future exactly. We know in general, in principle, but we don't, we, it's, it's, a, it's a process shaped by, by functions like free will. There's ideas, good and bad, that are warring it out right now. And we don't know what type of opportunities are going to emerge in the future that we may or may not be ready to respond to depending upon the work that we did or didn't do on ourselves and on our networks, our family, our friends, and, and beyond um, to prepare for such opportunities. So I think, yeah, we can't waste any time at this point. And so just the fact that we've spent our valuable Sunday afternoon, a couple hours here today, gathering and, and cultivating that, that pursuit of wisdom, I think is a really good, uh, a good use of time. And hopefully we continue that on. I know next week we have, um, a friend in uh, the Netherlands who's going to go through the uh, a new look at China. Uh, Franz van der Bosch is an academic, a historian. And he's uh, published a lot of books. He's going to go through um, an, an, an analysis of uh, China that I think is rare and refreshing for people in the West. Uh, we're going to have Joaquin, uh, Joaquin going through something in two weeks' time and, and a lot more planned down the pipeline. So, Alex, thank you again so much. And thank, every thank you, everyone, for coming by today. Uh Thank you all for the time and for listening. And my apologies that I had to cut this short. You know, I'm a I'm a single father of two, and I have this schedule of you know once one week I'm I'm on a, on a I'm on a tight ship, and one week I'm free as a bird. So you know, if this was next Sunday or the previous Sunday, I could stay here talking for three hours. Uh, but you know, I'm I'm very happy to do this again uh, as as situation uh, evolves. Uh, thank you to everyone who dropped me um, uh, a note in the chat, which, you know, as I, as I speak, I, I, I wasn't able to, uh, to reply to each, but it's uh, very highly appreciated to all. Thank you all again. Thank you for organizing, Matt. Uh, and uh, until the next happy occasion, onwards and upwards. Onwards and upwards. Bye, everyone. Right. Thank you, Alex. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank, Bye. You Bye. thank you all. Bye. Thanks, Alex. Bye. Thank you.